Hello, everyone. Hi. It's nice I'm getting uh, to recognize quite a few faces. So for those of you who have been here before, welcome back. Uh, it's nice to see uh, continuous support and interest among you. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome to Make Design Matter. Make Design Matter is a series of monthly talks, uh, which is organized by the BR in partnership with the BRE Trust. Um, we create a platform for design professionals who have work or an architectural philosophy that's similar or in line with ours. For those who are not familiar with Article 25, we are a small architectural charity. Um, we create design solutions for vulnerable communities around the world. We specialize in healthcare and education. We work in over 34 countries. We have around 80 projects at the moment. Um, as I said, we are a small charity, which means uh, that we're mainly composed uh, by volunteers like myself. Uh, and we mainly rely on donations. Yes, it's that awkward moment when I ask for donations. <laughs> I promise that's going to be quick. There are many ways in which you can do that. Um, we have tap to donate machines uh, around, I think, so you can come see one of us at the end if you'd like to donate. Every contribution counts, and it's really what keeps us going as a charity. Um, if you um, want to donate on a more regular basis, you can also become a monthly sponsor. So on all chairs, we have um, sign-up sheets uh, for donations, and you can donate as little as three pounds a month, which is really not that much when you think about it. It's only like one journey on the tuber. So it's not that bad. Um, and if you can donate money, which is totally okay, you can also donate time. Uh, we're always on the lookout for volunteers. Uh, be it in our architecture office in London, but also abroad. So that's it about donations, I promise. <laughs> All right, um, back to the event. Tonight's talk will be delivered by Kelly Doran, who is a senior partner at Mass Design Group. It will last around 35 minutes. Kelly will be talking about the projects he's been Im involved with in uh, Kigali Rwanda, after which we will have a panel discussion uh, for about 20 minutes, and this will be followed by a Q&A. Before uh, handing over, I'd like to thank Horley for providing the space for the tonight's event, and of course the BRE Trust, without whom we wouldn't be able to have those events. So I'll be handing over now to Kelly. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Um, honored to be here, thank you for the invitation. Got to meet Article 25 uh, in person last week, and it's uh, kindred spirits, I would say, organizationally. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm with Mass Design Group. I'm going to move over towards the camera here. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and my mic, I think my mic's on. Um, I think uh, I, I want to, we have, we've got about 35 minutes to present our work, and then hopefully we can have some discussion afterwards. So I wanted to open up with some provocation for this evening. So <clears throat> the first is a, Little known Italian architect of you know from uh, from Team Ten that I don't think many people recognize, and I think his his work we're working right now on putting together a documentary uh, about his life's work and um, the kind of role that he had. Uh, our founder Michael did a thesis on him, uh, and uh, back in the 70s, I mean 40 40 years ago, um, looking really at, at at the state of architecture at that point, and the thing I, that that this quote really resonates with me is that like you could put 2018 and you'd feel the exact same about it. Um, and he, his work really, I think, was the touchstone of the basis of our organization. I'll put him on one side of tonight's conversation and this gentleman on the other side of it. And I think like this, you know, uh, you know fair, fair enough has been taken a task for, for uh, his point of view. Um, I think a lot of people would probably agree with it. Um, and certainly probably preaching the choir here, people that would not. So. Um, I think that this, these, this, these two positions, I think, uh, would be how I want to couch this evening's conversation. What is our role as architects or as engineers? Um, so um, how can we, architects, beyond, everybody in the construction profession, advocate for ourselves? I think we're at a critical point where we need to understand what it is we're doing as a profession and be able to advocate for our role in society, re-engage society in a different way and expand what it is we do and, and how we can have impact in the world uh, that we work. 
Um, I think, you know, over the past decade or two, we, we found ways to begin to measure and, you know, record our, our value. You know, like I think lead is a very simple way of, hey, we're making good decisions and, and here it is, you as a client, you know, what color do you want? You know, this, we, can, we can do this for you. And at this point, this is kind of baked into our practice. I don't think, you know, I think firms that would advertise themselves as being like green at this point would look fairly passe, I'd imagine, because we should all be at this point. Um, how do we do this? We tick a bunch of boxes. It's very kind of quantitative. Things came from here and this is the, you know, this is how we value our, our projects so far. And, and, and at Mass, we were interested, you know, we worked with a lot of uh, originally healthcare providers, um, NGOs, people that ask for donations. And the people that are giving them money are often asking them, what are you doing with my money? How can you prove that my money has impact? What can you show me? that my million dollars to Partners in Health this year like, was worth it, right? And so we're, as architects, we think, well, this is interesting. How do we, how do, how, like a doctor or like a, you know, someone managing a hospital, how can we have the same metrics? How do we set those metrics for ourselves so we can come back and illustrate it's not just about how beautiful it is or people really like it, but it actually has tangible things that we can point to that our service added value. Um, and I think that in looking at everything that's out there, uh, you know, most of it was a kind of around environmental, as you'll see in a second. Some things on economic, very little have to do with the emotional resonation of a project, what it teaches people. And these are all we see as indirect outcomes of a project. And the one thing that they don't really talk to is the mission of the project. What, what is the thing about? Like, why, why is this building getting built in the world, right? And how do we... How can, how can it be the sum of its parts? So in looking at all the ways out there right now that people measure and evaluate their work or, hey, we got to lead platinum, it's very much these indirect things. Like you might have very good environmental impact, but it's not really hitting home at nothing around the kind of mission of an organization necessarily or the larger systemic effects that that project has in the environment that they're placed within. So back to DiCarlo's quote here, you know, this kind of narrow strip that we are confined to, largely in this design. I mean, I'd say the vast majority of our fees are, are at this point of a project, and we've given up the territory, I think, historically. We want to get upstream much more. We're involved in construction a little bit, not much. Very little post-occupancy. I mean, saying this very broad statements, I'm aware. But how can we really get back to a kind of broader understanding of our role? and the impact that we can have and the decisions that we make and design downstream. And also, you know, I, I say when we get to a design or an RFP, you're already too late to the party. That's, the thing's already been written for you. So how can we move further upstream to be asking the big questions of the people that need, need our services? You know, what is your project? How is your money going to really support you as an organization or a hospital or a school or you, you name it? And on the other end, how is that money well spent? And what, how can you go back to your donor group and prove that that money that they put into it, your donor group, your government, your client, whoever, had tangible effect? Like that's kind of what we're trying to do. So uh, MASS stands for the mo a Model of Architecture of Serving Society. Um, we, uh, we're a mission-driven organization. We are a 401c3 in the state of Delaware, which in the United States is the equivalent of a charity here. So by, by, by our constitution, we have to have a mission, and, our, and that is like our, our own mission, and we think that every project needs one too. And like when you start out, it needs to be there, and everybody involved needs to be bought into it. Um, <coughs> we started in a country called Rwanda, which if you're an Arsenal fan now, you know exactly where it is. Um, the, it's in the center of, of Africa, it's a, it's a great place to have landed 10 years ago. Um, there were seven architects when we started and we were brought there by um, a couple doctors that were asked by the Ministry of Health to go into rural Rwanda in a district called Bataro where there were a lot of people and no hospitals and there were no doctors. Um, on the left, uh, Dr. Paul Farmer, one of the founders of Partners in Health, uh, and on the right, uh, Dr. Beniwahu, who at that point was the Minister of Health. Um, you basically, we were volunteers and we, we went down there and spent two years to design a hospital together on the kind of good faith that we knew what we were doing. Um, and this is what it ended up looking like after two years of, you know, a lot of time spent together. You know, at the outset of this project, 
recently, this is, we started about 2006, and we were, uh, it was before my time at Mass, admittedly, but started by a couple folks in grad school. This project had just been built, and there, were re there was research coming out of uh, this, this hospital in South Africa that there was a TB outbreak, in this, and it was, it was back to that room. So people who were going to a hospital to seek treatment for tuberculosis or nothing else would end up getting sicker and, and, and basically catching a disease by going to the place meant to prevent health right, or prevent disease. So the kind of, the, the, you know, the observation was like architecture was killing people, literally. Poorly designed buildings, poorly thought out natural ventilation, cramped space, everything on the right that you could probably see certainly as a mechanical engineer. Like, that's a problem, right? We're like thinking, okay, well, wh why is that the case? Um, look at the history of, of healthcare and really just going back from, from first principles, you know, Nightingale's hospitals in the Crimean War looked radically different. Big, tall ceilings, bright, airy, natural circulation. Everything about that space is the opposite. Um, you know, the, the, the Altos, Altos work that's about outdoor space, open air, access to landscape, all the things that like, we thought probably were good ideas in healthcare. And then studying and looking at hospitals over the last century, a move from Alto's work to say, the UCL hospital, a, a box, a box where all the windows are on the outside and everybody spends their days in the middle. And the problems that we've arrived at, and I have to say this within a, a firm that does HVAC, but like we basically have gotten to hospitals to the point that they're on respiratory systems themselves, right? So this as a problem, I'd say, of just healthcare, generally speaking. I don't know if anybody works in healthcare here, but um, in a place like Bataro, where there was no power when we started, there was, we did a little microhydro dam. So uh, we did everything we could to cut down lighting, cut down, uh, uh, like, use natural systems, use natural ventilation, because we couldn't rely on electricity. And frankly, it's the perfect climate. You know, it's 25 degrees, 30 degrees every day. There's no need for heating or cooling. So you can get away with a lot. Back to first principles, back to the kind of nightingale ideas. Wards that are bright, airy, uh, you know, uh, natural ventilation across, beds that face a landscape. Kind of simple first principles, re-employed. Um, building a hospital, using the local materials that were around it, doing some really intuitive things, frankly, out of necessity. So in this case, we use volcanic stone that comes out of the soil in that region. There's, it's a heavily vulcanized area. And you know, learning the lesson of the material is the expensive thing, the labor is, is, is inexpensive. It's the, you know, the inversion of, say, definitely a European context. So why not maximize labor in this context? Um, and it's a free material in this case. So um, you know, really right, push the craftsmanship. I think we begin to get recognition out of this, you know, getting, getting uh, the front page of the Times here of, like, oh wow, there's something different here. There's some, maybe a turn in how we think about healthcare. Um, I think on the back of the success of Bataro, uh, the next step was, okay, great, we've got a great hospital, people are coming to it, we need some doctors. The only way we're going to keep doctors that are going to come here to train the next generation of doctors is if they've got nice housing. So our second project was housing for doctors and, uh, and residents. On the back of that, the kind of, like this, the kind of snowballing effect was, uh, the next was, well, we have a lot of cancer right now. When we were in Rwanda, there was no oncology treatment in the country at all. There was little to none in all of East Africa. So they, with, uh, with, um, with Partners in Health, again, built the first oncology center in the region. So this is, we renovated an old uh, barracks, added a wing to it, and this is where people come to get chemotherapy. Again, kind of bright, uh, open area, open to the, to the landscape. Um, and now this is currently in construction. Uh, people are coming from as far as South Sudan to get cancer treatment in Rwanda. So the demand for the service that's there now, we're building a hospice or a hostel for people and their families to come and receive cancer treatment. And this is, uh, yeah, this is topping up this week. Um, and the last kind of like snowball effect is a hill over, and this is opening in about a month, is an, and now a whole uh, uh, medical university. Uh, it's called the University of Global Health Equity. And this will be basically people coming from around the world to learn how to give, uh, to, to deliver medicine in rural areas specifically around the world and about partners in health's kind of attitude um, uh, to, to the delivery of health care to the poorest of the poor. Um, on the back of that and begin to see the snowball, right place, right time, 
the Ministry of Health is like, wow, great hospital. We need 30 more. Um, we need some standards. Can you help us write those? So my first project was basically to come up with the, the plans for all future district hospitals, the kind of basic DNA and what they look like. They said, great job on those. Now we want to test drive them. And we have two hospitals now, two more hospitals. Uh, one, this is downtown Kigali getting built, 300 bed district hospitals, uh, both with the government of Rwanda. So begin to see small steps, you know, and, and in a market that recognize the value of design and, and where it can take you. Um, I th just to kind of pivot to a couple other projects here now to really kind of our mission of like, you know, having that mission for that project in that case to really think about healthcare in a holistic way. The second is then, what, through what method? How are you doing it as a designer? What decisions can you make um, to maximize that impact uh, across the process? Hopefully the volume works here. So this is the, the trailer for a documentary we did about the school um, in Congo. As you can see, it's like in the middle of, of the DRC. Um, and th we were asked by the African Wildlife Foundation to uh, help them design and build a school, probably the most remote part of Africa, if not the world. Uh, and they, they are building these schools a way for, to encourage conservation through education. Basically, they broker a deal with the community. We'll build you a school in return and teach you agricultural techniques and do not go and hunt in the bush and this specific there's an endangered ape called the bonobo ape nearby that they're trying to preserve so that that brokering that deal with the community through the construction of the school now um when you're building literally in the middle of, of i mean it's somewhere but it's 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 very difficult to get to and i'll show you in a map in a second um and as you can see on that video to get here, you fly to a town, you take a barge, and then you sit on the back of a, of a motorbike for four hours down a path that's as wide as your shoulders. So, you know, your decisions as a designer are limited as far as what's your material palette, what can I build out of, how do we, how do we get things here, right? It's, you can't helicopter things in, and then also, when it's done, how are they going to maintain it, right? So, a uh, great set of constraints for a for design brief, and it takes you, again, back to kind of some early principles about decisions you make. So, um, I, I look at a school and a kind of sense of like you can see wood shingles, uh, wood doors, all locally made, earth bricks, again, you saw in the video a little bit. And, you know, uh, when we went there, we did a lot of research on the wood of the, the forest that are around there and found species that are termite resistance that you, like similar to a cedar, that you could use for the shingle that were readily available that could go out and cut. And so we basically went there, tested the wood. It comes out this incredibly like, you know, r blood red color and it grays out after a while. Um, you know, did the research and then taught them, basically went back how to make like, how to make shingles. Um, and, and that's how, that's the story of that roof. Overall, the building itself, uh, the only things that were brought in on the back of a bike were like the tools and like a couple nails and screws. Everything else was like sourced like within about 10 kilometers uh, largely um, from a material perspective. So you can see like steel tube. Uh, we did a, a thorough audit. We worked with MIT to really kind of go through. We really want to understand what this project's cost was. So this is the kind of like all the material that went into it. And you can see most of it did not travel far except for the rebar and the steel tube here. Most everything else comes within a couple kilometers. Um, the carbon footprint of this project is kind of embarrassingly, embarrassingly low. Uh, like, I don't know, it's, 
28 times less than your average school. So from a CO2 perspective, this, this, this project's incredible. Um, and and <laughs> I mean, our next one in Rwanda, look, it's about five times as big. That's very local as well, and the global average. So we were really, we wanted to do this kind of math to really illustrate that these choices, you know, though necessary, also have like real effect and have probably uh, I would challenge to say doing something in London would be far easier than doing it in the middle of Congo for the same kind of exercise. Um, also from we were the general contractor so we had a lot of uh, agency over tracking the numbers. Um, where did all this money go? There's this, this school cost $250,000 to build. Um, all of that pretty much went into labor because all the materials for the most part were well relatively free obviously via the labor. Of that labor, you can see, I think, the amount of jobs we created went into a community that hasn't had employment ever, like, or at least for a few decades. So we're the first people to bring jobs to a place. And we're like, how do we really take advantage of this and give people new skills as well? Um, here's where it is. So to get there, you fly to Kinshasa, then you fly to another little town, then you take a barge for a day, and then you drive in. So the, the impact of that money here too, like so much of it went into the immediate surround. So like politically, and how it worked within the country, it was a really easy story to tell, like, we're gonna go in here and here's why, and that money's not gonna make its way back to Kinshasa, it's gonna be in Ecuador. Um, <clears throat> another way to think about projects and, and move over to Malawi is uh, the, that, that kind of method leads to, to impact. So impact, I think, right now is a, a pretty, you know, everybody uses the word very loosely. Um, I think we were concerned we did too. I think everybody was like, we need to have impact. So, how do you measure it too? Again, because we are like started with healthcare professionals that needed metrics, we're like, how do we actually prove this? How do we prove to our donors that we're, that we're doing something with it? And again, this kind of like cross-cutting. So the methods that we're, that we're doing it through and things that we can go back to and actually measure. So in the previous project, you can see we're measuring economic, environmental. This one, we kind of really wanted to figure out educational and emotional impact. And it's a maternity waiting village in uh, Malawi. So, uh, Fairly recently, the government made it mandatory if it's your first, fifth, or more pregnancy, you're required by law to travel to a district hospital to give birth uh, because of the, the, the potential complications. This is where you go. So um, you travel at, your, at the beginning of your uh, se like seven and a half month, or like the, basically the last six weeks of your pregnancy. So you can imagine most women need to travel quite a distance, are going to bring you know, a family member, a friend, someone to help take care of them. Uh, and they show up and this is like, great, I'm gonna stay here for six, uh, six weeks, right? Um, this is the, the plan. I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a barracks or it's a barn. Um, it's poorly lit, it's cramped, and there was no space for the person or people that came with mothers. So basically, you can imagine this floor plan is missing three times the beds required for the amount of people that are coming to use this space. So we figured, okay, we can do better than this and we're gonna figure out how to use the same amount of money and solve that issue. So first thing is cut it up a little bit, get more cross ventilation, put a roof on it bigger than the one that's there. If you've been to Malawi, it's, it's hot, it's arid. Um, capture the water as much as possible uh, because it is arid and recycle it. And, and people are coming from villages. So how can the form actually reflect the places they're coming from, they, they feel comfortable. So this is what it, it led to. It's a series of smaller bedrooms instead of one big space. You can see five mothers uh, basically share these spaces, and there's a and there's a space for the the community health workers as well. We use the structure against CSCBs and the the concrete, the built up a kind of typological language that use the columns to make benches and furniture and everything else, and be a bit more in service of having just had a child and watched watched my own wife through pregnancy. You know, women don't want to be a, in a bed all day. They want to be moving around constantly. They want like sitting, moving, con always moving around. I mean, that's uh, the constant discomfort. I'm sure people in here are like, yeah, absolutely. So the kind of images tell the story a little bit. And as a result too, this is before the landscape came in. Uh, when I got to visit for the opening, it, it, they used the space for uh, family planning as well, which is a kind of great outcome of this project is they're away from their husbands and they can teach these women Okay, here are the basics, so you can go back and, you know, you don't need to be here for your sixth or seventh. Um, our, our thesis, and coming back to the beginning of, like, we think we can do better, 
how do we prove we actually did better? Because our design fees are probably five to 10 times more than the local architect that did that, the, the first project we saw, right? So how do you prove to somebody it's worth that investment? Because in many cases, the design fees are going to equal or surpass the construction costs in, in, this, in this kind of work. So this was our thesis and we're like, okay, we need to prove this. We went out and we got a grant uh, to do some research. Um, we cl collected a, late, a lot of data. We put together a survey uh, and we gave it to these women to basically conduct the survey at both locations, both built by the same client, both parts of the, parts of the country that were comparable um, and gave them a survey that basically the mothers could fill out to really think about, okay, is this, is this working? Are, they, are there tangible differences between these two locations? Now, it's not perfect. It's definitely not completely scientific because you'd need a mother to have visited both to really understand it, but it began to get at the core of the, the experience of the architecture. This is what it ended up looking like, and out of it, um, oh, out of it, we actually got it published in the Journal of Midwifery that the outcomes were actually positive. These qualitative, like things, like wow, okay, like people were responding to us. Some of the theses that we had at the beginning actually had effect. And like, I, as married to a, someone in public health, I was like, wow, okay, great. We're like, we're proving it in someone else's field and the people that are making decisions about capital expenditure. Uh, the last thing is a kind of through the kind of last wheel is how do you have a bigger, broader systemic change? So if you're having impact, how can this project, there's so much work out there, change the mind and the expectation of an area of what they expect of architecture? And I think this is the kind of biggest question because we can't, we, we're certainly not able to, to meet the demand of like how many schools, hospitals need to get built. It needs to change fundamentally across it and the people making the decisions about how money is getting spent have to see something, they're like, no, that's the way we need it. That needs to be that good. Um, <clears throat> we were invited to Haiti um, uh, just a kind of after the earthquake had hit, but, uh, and all the kind of residual effects of the earthquake um, that happened was, uh, as, as you probably well know, um, it's not just the earthquake, but the cholera epidemic that followed it. So we were brought in by uh, Dr. Pop here, who started uh, Jeskio originally you know, worked to basically eradicate uh, HIV AIDS from the island and then saw the cholera epidemic happening and asked us to come and help them out. Um, as the cholera epidemic started uh, in, in, in these places, which is, um, uh, this is how it was being treated, sorry, which is these temporary tents that people were kind of brought to by all of the relief agencies that were coming in. Um, it was brought by these, these guys, um, kind of well known. The relief workers brought the disease back with them to an island that did not have it for a century. So um, out of that, again, we have a bit of a mu movie here that kind of documents the story of our project and, and the kind of approach. I went into infectious diseases because I knew that they were the diseases that kill my people. I thought that this was a profession where you could actually do something. Breaking news out of Haiti, a massive catastrophic earthquake has struck the country. Tens of thousands of people. A couple hundred thousand dead. All that we have done within a few seconds were destroyed. Nine months after the earthquake, a new disaster in Haiti, an epidemic of cholera. 20,000 cases nationwide. Up to 200,000 people. Yes, there was a big earthquake and then this cholera hit, but they were completely unrelated. Haiti, we need to hit cholera very hard. We need to make sure that the bacteria doesn't stay into our soil, into our water. Clearly, the infrastructure is key. There was always a sense that we could do better to create a structure that would be adapted to the needs of the people and that would have some kind of dignity that is fully Haitian. Development does not rely on health. Economic opportunities and education are also essential. This is a revolution. A revolution positive.
So as you can see in the video, the, I mean, the issue with cholera at, in the camps that was being dealt with is that the water that was being collected was being put back into the water stream upstream from it and therefore like the vicious cycle was getting worse and worse and worse. So we, we designed a building where it's all captured on site. The water, the rainwater is collected and it's dealt with on this underground cistern that, uh, that basically that maintains it and does not allow it to spread and people come and actually get healthier and leave. So um, this is kind of view of the inside. So we built a, a building designed to leak in the middle, um, <laughs> which is kind of foolish, but works quite well that the whole roof drains to the middle into these gardens that take it down um, and the light. And we also work to design a chair that can be easily removed and cleaned. Uh, as if you've, if you've seen cholera, it's incredibly uh, un undignified disease that, that requires a lot of just bodily fluids coming out of your body. So from a worker's perspective, something they could really quickly clean. In looking at how to build the facade of the building, which is about privacy and light control, the, if you've been to AT, these buses are like incredibly ornate and there's a lot of local um, uh, metal workers. And so we wanted to engage these craftspeople to make that facade. And this is Mackenzie, one of the people here that ultimately handcrafted all these things instead of digitally fabricating them. And that was the result. So uh, kind of in conclusion of who we are. So our mission uh, is to build and research and advocate for an architecture that promotes that. So being here as part of the advocacy, I think You've seen the film work we do is about that too. How do we tell the story of the people and the places that these projects are happening that advocate not just for like us as an organization, but us as a series of profession, professionals. Um, we're, we're constitutive of a kind of growing group of, of people. We have offices uh, in, we started in, in Rwanda. We have an office in Boston and in Monrovia and Liberia, and I'm starting one here in London. Um, our people often ask us, you're a nonprofit, uh, what does that mean? Um, and I think that the, the way w that we can explain this is a bit um, jokingly say all architects are nonprofits. We're just designed that way. Um, that, that it allows us to have a certain flexibility and say no to things. And it allows us to kind of, uh, I think over, over the, our trajectory, you see a lot of most of our work early has been designed, but we're starting to get more into research and advocacy work and, and training, investing a lot of time and energy and resources into the young people in our staff specifically to bring them up and build up the profession, specifically MEP in, in Rwanda, where it largely did not exist. Our work historically that was started in Africa is now we're seeing kind of it, we're, we're seeing it take traction, uh, have traction in the United States and I'm here to hopefully bring it to, uh, to the UK and beyond. Um, we're a collective as a nonprofit, you don't have any ownership. So I think most of the people here are, are, are wanting to be here for the work. Um, we at this year, we're about, uh, our revenue is 80% fees. So as we started out, we we're probably 20% fees, 80% philanthropy and, and fundraising. But we've managed over time to get paying work. And I think that the typical, uh, you know, your usual architect, this is your fee distribution over phases. And back to the kind of close the loop on the, on the conversation, not much happening pre-design or visioning. If you're lucky to get up there, nothing happening uh, post-occupancy uh, by and large. Why we're not profit is that the little layer that we get to kind of raise funds for, we get to put on top of that and, and invest some, some money up front. We're spending our money to say, we want to help you figure this out as an organization to get it to the point that you can get fundraising yourself to raise for the building. And also like the grants that we just showed for Malawi, get on the back end to actually prove the work out. So, um, you know, that, that extra 20% that again, we raise funds uh, just, just like you. <laughs> Um, is we can spend in these kind of these other phases of the project to kind of build that work out and help tell that story. So traditionally, I think fundamentally, this is the structural problem in our profession is that our influence really strong up front, but as we kind of approach construction and the decision making at the end, we're just like less and less important throughout the end. And that's when the money's actually having the most impact is in construction. How can we get to a point where we can make more decisions, have more say? Um, so we see that that extra kind of layer allows us to hopefully, you know, be, be a player through all stages. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm a trustee of Article 25 and my background is environmental engineering design. So, um, 
Um, we work on things like ventilation strategies, daylight strategies, and, um, and um, we, we have engineers that second to Article 25, so we've got some of our designers here that have worked on projects that do low-maintenance low buildings. Um, and, and when you talked about um, healthcare, actually the, 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 the founder of our consultancy 155 years ago, he, he designed the first uh, comfort-controlled uh, hospital, and, and, and that, that, uh, that was because uh, he, he wanted to, to help make sure the conditions were, were, were um, uh, adequate for health provision. So um, I'm, I'm just going to ask a question, and, and then I'll open it up to the audience. So um, you mentioned uh, materi sustainable materials, and it was great to see the low impact you had. How, is, is that something you always look at at the site to, to get local materials? And, and, and then, B, I'd like to, you to answer that as well about how important that is on projects. It, and is that something we could do in... in, in Western countries as well. Yeah. 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 Uh, I, th I think, okay, so the uh, simple answer is yes, all the time. Um, I think in every context we would look for that. And I th the way, the easiest way to talk about it is I think the movement that we've seen in food needs to come back to the built environment. Like that 100 mile diet approach or the slow food, whatever that is. I think that that's basically our approach here. So. That's happening through the kind of lead credentials of like, where's your material coming from? How far, like, where's it transported from? I think that you could really expand that discussion about the labor that's involved, the transportation, like how it's managed, you know. We, all the wood that we ever use is gonna be FSC certified. And we're working with a logger in Rwanda to get that certification so we can procure from them because there's no one in the country doing it. Um, I, uh, I think in some cases it's just like, it's the right thing to do. It's just so obvious and is beginning to happen. But I think there's a whole other kind of set of, of like maybe standards or ways we could be talking about it to really break that down and see the whole value chain about how things are going from cradle to gate, as we would say, you know, um, where did they come from? Who's making them? Um, how many processes along the way to really make informed decisions um, about where materials are coming from, yeah? I think it's, it we, we should be thinking about it more in, in, in projects in the UK and Europe, but I think okay. there's someone will pick a, a window or a piece of furniture that could come from a long way, and um, that, that circular economy thinking is something we need to go more towards. Okay. And, and B, on, on, on the projects that you've been doing with Article 25, how, how do you work with the local community to find out where materials are coming from and making sure they're local? Well, we, we source them locally. We see what's available in the village market or the town market. And we, a lot of times, work with materials that you can dig out of the ground. Yeah. Um, and it, it working in a low resource context, such as Africa and Asia, is both a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing because you can't spend any money. There is no money. So you are pushed toward those sorts of materials and it's easier to embrace them. But there's also something else and that is the expectation of the community that you're working with and they don't want mud. That's what their grandparents had. They want something modern. They want something shiny, beautiful, and overcoming that barrier through design by designing something beautiful with those materials that looks modern is actually quite a task. And it's gr a great task because it's a challenge to us. And we have several times already on recent projects had to overcome it, w the benefit to the project because it looks and has come out much better than it might otherwise have. So you don't stop at the first solution saying, oh, well, here it is, you can do it like that, because it won't be acceptable. And the aspiration of the community is as important as um, what we want to do or what, what they need in terms of the building. They, they want more than just the utility of it. They want the pride that comes with it. 
as well as the ownership of having built it. And I thought for us, it's been over the last few years, it's been quite an experience to, to understand that properly. And, and I, th I think um, the buildings you showed had beauty, perfect functionality, simplicity. So that beauty and sustainability works together. Yeah. So we've got some great expertise here with lots of international experience. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, oh, could you say who you are, where you're from as well? Uh, thanks. Tom, uh, I work at Florian Sad Architects. Um, I used to work for Architect 25 and volunteer. Um, I really enjoyed the, the kind of diagram of how your fee structure works at the end and how the kind of pre and post construction or design phase is so difficult to get funding for. Mm -hmm. And I wonder. Is there something we can do as designers to advocate to get enlightened clients who will pay for that, both in a kind of development context but also in a just general context? Sure. Um, and does there need to have kind of top-down structural things like a lead accreditation for that kind of thing? I would kind of flip and response to that question. I think uh, <clears throat> that pre-design work, um, we are far too often doing it for free on spec or whatever that is. And I think that's a fundamental problem with our profession. And I don't know, I, I was talking to somebody yesterday who was uh, a lawyer and a PR person. I said, would you do anything on spec on the good faith that you get a contract out of it? And they're like, never, are you kidding me? Yet yeah, we do it repeatedly. Um, so we are, we are removing ourselves structurally from a lot of that work by doing it for free. Um, and I think Dan, it, I mean, that's my first comment. I think we're horrible as a, as a profession uh, for self-governance. So I mean, my stop working for free would be my first statement. Uh, and I think the, the structural way to do it too, I think is, um, would be through professional bodies. Like I think that would be through advocating and saying, this is the kind of thing that needs to fundamentally stop and we need to get people on, to like buy in on this and stop cutting each other out at every stop. It's not a race to the bottom. Um, and begin to broaden things out again. So I think it's a structural issue with the profession, and I, and I think it's pretty endemic. Certainly uh, the same in Canada as I suspect here. Is that because you're also passionate about the work, though? So but but why would you do anything yeah. for free? Because you love it so much. <laughs> I don't know. No, because you do it for free, you've devalued your service. Yeah. So, yeah. Phil so, Armitage from X Forum. Um, and I mean, wouldn't the world be a better place if everybody did something for free? What's that? Wouldn't the world be a better place if everybody did something for free? I Maybe. Yeah. Lawyers. <laughs> they could do something for free. Yeah. But I think that this, and we talked about this a bit, I mean, it's a longer discussion, is the, uh, <laughs> I just think if you're donating your time, and this is the difference here, if you're donating your time, that's different, right? But how are you paying for that donation, right? Because at the end of the day, everybody needs work, everybody needs to be employed. Um, so we're, I mean, in many cases, we're donating our time to someone who could pay for it. I think more often than not, like I'd say the majority of pro bono work or speculative work is certainly for people that can certainly afford your labor. So of all of the, of all of the people out there that could really use your services, um, I mean, my, my typical response to a student on this question would be, don't do competitions, find some local agency that could really use an architect service and go volunteer your time with them. Because that would be a better world. Yeah, uh, and then we had a question over here somewhere as well. Yeah, thanks. Jacqueline Blanher, Global Urban Design. Um, I'm curious to hear about your experience. Uh, so can you share a bit about consulting, collaborating, and engaging that process. Hmm. Like a sp specifically or? Well, okay, <coughs> you, you gave an example and there was a two year gap uh, from sort of project initiation or inception yeah. and, and uh, design and delivery. Yeah. And I imagine there's a lot of dialogue going on in between that. So Absolutely. if you could maybe share some of that. Yeah. That would be useful. Well, and I, I think like, you know, we're, I've, I've been living in Rwanda for the last five years, and the interesting thing about practicing there is things move very fast, actually. 
uh, interesting, that country specifically, like I want it tomorrow. Um, a design document for a hospital took us three months. It's crazy. Um, that appetite to catch up and go through requires so much like work along the way to engage the client, and in some cases, the Ministry of Health, the doctors, all the engineers, meeting every week, really kind of taking it on, not different than a project before, but at a far different pace. So that's at one end of the scale is how quickly that consultation is kind of happening and how engaged, um, I'd say how engaged doctors are in the design of the project, which have never worked on healthcare outside of that context, but I suspect probably doesn't happen as much. Um, and then on the flip side, some projects take forever. Um, and I won't name countries, but some countries it takes a long time to do the politicking required and get the background relationships and really spend the time understanding the people on the ground that can, when a problem comes up, you can call and they're gonna answer that. They're gonna answer that phone call and be the person to say, yes, move this along, along the way. And that, I think, that kind of relationship building, we're, we're building a new national, uh, Liberia's National Hospital. We've been there for 10 years, helping them you know, we wrote the RFP with them, that's getting upstream. We wrote the grant application, we did the programming, went to the World Bank. Like we, we donated quarter million of our services just to get the project. Um, and that wasn't speculative work, that was like Liberia needs a hospital. Clinton Health Access Initiative said, Mass, go there and help them figure this out, you know? So that kind of long engagement is now resulting in finally their own, you know, a national uh, hospital. So the kind of flip sides of the context they're working in. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. But do you see situations where we're working on projects and the end users want the building quicker than you want to deliver it because you want to do certain, you want to follow certain engagement or protocol and, and then how do you manage that expectation of somebody saying, can we have this facility quickly and you, you want to do your due diligence? How do you manage that? Well, you, first of all, you, um, you talk to the people who are in such a hurry and make, you know, make it clear that the, the planning process actually will make the project better. If you don't know what you're doing, yes, you can always launch in and build something, um, a chicken coop maybe, but if it's something that needs to prove its value and that actually contributes to education or healthcare or whatever the function of the building is and is better than um, can be thrown up in a shed, it needs to be planned. That doesn't mean it can't move. And there are, we, we are all rather well trained in overlapping design and construction mm -hmm. and solving construction problems through design while things are being built. And that's no different in developing countries than it is here. In fact, um, on our projects, we use WhatsApp as a RFI procedure, and we usually answer it the same day with another WhatsApp. So it, it is no different, and you can engage quickly, but you still need to do it. You still need to do all that planning. I would like to raise a different question at the risk of holding back other questions, but I thought this w you made one really interesting point, and that was acting as a contractor. Mm -hmm. on one project, which chimed in with the idea of architects taking back some of the master builder role mm -hmm. to actually get something built. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious as to the thought process, because on the one hand, it gives much more control over construction and lets you employ workers really efficiently. On the other hand, it possibly discourages local enterprise mm -hmm because the local contractor who has to take a little bit of a risk to get something built and to get it done um, is precluded. So I'm, I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, on that way of proceeding. Yeah, the well, advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, we, we're, we're actually debating whether or not we go become general contractors or project managers to, to do that because we've been doing it on a couple schools and um, like, I think we're more just doing, we're acting as the GC and then subcontracting local contractors underneath that. But we can control payroll, we can make sure wages are like set. We, the school that we built, 50% are women on site. Like, we, you, can, you can have a lot more agency on the actual 
because that's where all the money's getting spent is through the construction. So if you're, you know, that kind of construction management or project management role, you know, uh, if you can if you can take that role and you want to do it and have the patience and fortitude to do it, mm -hmm. that's where all your decisions are only as good as the people that actually implement them. So that's, I mean, that's where the maximum effect of the of the money is going to happen. So, yeah. And we've done it on small scales. Big scales, I think we'd like to, th maybe we'll scale up. But yeah. so you're, you're pursuing this. This was not a one-off. Yeah. It's something that you're, yep. you may carry forward. Yep. It's interesting. Yep. A couple of questions here. Yeah. Mine was a bit of a follow-up question about the, like how, how, do you, how you operate on the ground. Mm. So whether you have any particular um, methods for co-design, um, engagement, interviewing, yep. seeing how people act normally, those kinds of things yep. within the process. So we have a uh, yeah, and that's I guess that I guess that's the part of that pre-design work too. That immer we call it immersion, pre-design visioning, working with the community. Like at Alima, we went and spent a month there. Like, like what is here? Who's here? What are you, what can you do? Like that amount of kind of work. Like we do that on all of our projects, and I think that's again having to spend that time to do the due diligence due diligence to do the amount of stakeholder engagement, make sure the community is fully on board. And this doesn't matter if you're in the middle of Congo or downtown London, you should be spending that amount of time with your, your end user to really understand their needs, I think. And again, that's typically a fairly underfunded part of the work. And that's a lot of time, I mean, that's being delivered to you in like a, an RFP or, you know, someone else has done that for you and written the, the, the tender that you're responding to. So I think we, we heavily invest in that phase because that's where you get buy-in mm -hmm. and you avoid a lot of the problems that happen down, downstream. It's like, actually, I didn't want that or like I wasn't engaged or you're going to have like, you know, someone who could shut your project down or because you didn't really understand the, you know, the ecosystem that you're working with them. Um, so that's a big advantage, again, of the kind of we can spend the time upstream uh, at that stage. If you go to our website, we have an immersion field guide um, that we're looking to publish to put it out there to show kind of basically open source our approach. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Hani. I'm from McCrane Lavington Architects. Um, I have a question about uh, just generally trying to get an understanding of what your perception of, of movements within architecture mm. are like. So, especially with Mass Design Group, but there's also a lot of other, uh, there's a lot of energy and a lot of innovation that's going on in a lot of. Um, I'm going to use the term developing states, but I uh, know that's not the right term. But yep. um, and I'm wondering how can we trans kind of bring that energy and innovation into states, what countries like the UK or, or anywhere in Europe or parts of the US or Canada, where perhaps there's we're starting to see less innovation because it's innovation is inaccessible to well in the forms that that maybe the industry recognises. So my question is, how can we take the the lessons that you're learning and actually employ them in a context that's not necessarily driven by innovation in any way. Define innovation context. for me. How are, you, how are you using it? So, for example, when you talk about um, uh, your project in, in, in Lima, I think it was called, yep. um, you know, you spent a whole month uh, there studying up the site, studying up the resources, and looking at, at what you had available, and that's not necessarily a luxury that a lot of uh, commercial practices have. Mm. So, how uh, and I, I, I wish that we did have that. Like, yeah. So my question is, how can how can you maybe learn from that and also bring that into practice? Uh, and how can you also then convince the client that <coughs> innovation in square meters is not always the best kind of innovation? It's mm. not just best to get cheap. Well, I, I, you know, we the question that was asked of us five years ago is, how, okay, great, you're you're doing this in Africa, you know, doing that kind of work, and I don't really see how you're going to bring it to the United States, and I don't know how. If you follow us, but you know we built a pretty significant project last year um, in Alabama that that kind of shows that you can take that approach and you can bring it anywhere. Um, and that's been our goal for a while to kind of illustrate that. I think uh, the kind of easy answer to that there's there's two ways. Um, and I think one is if you are a resident of a place, you kind of begin to really understand your neighborhood, your community, wherever you're living. You're spending a lot of time, regardless, getting to know the place you're working in, right? And I think that that's one that would be one thing. And I know I met met I had met Thomas Heatherwick last week and, and talked about this project. I mean, you know, just knowing the area, beginning to have a sense of like the place of wanting to get back to this part of London, you know, through albeit a, a commercial project. But 
getting to know your place and finding opportunities to have to donate your, your 10% of your time locally, I think would be my advice. I think the overall movement, I, I hopefully we would see ourselves as like part of a movement of, of, of designers that want to get back to to Carlo. You know, the kind of work that, that people were doing, um, I think, you know, I think I, certainly when I went through school a decade ago, this was not on my radar. Um, I think that increasingly it is on people's radar. This is looking for meaningful work, looking to have a kind of a, like a different um, employ their tools and knowledge and skill set to better the lives of the people around them. I mean, simply put, and that doesn't matter if it's, you know, London or Lima, um, it should be the same thing. So, I mean, I think we should all have missions of, uh, as organizations to be doing, you know, doing that kind of work. As an extrapolation of that, it, it's almost, Pat, there's, there's the statement, um, necessity is the mother of invention. And if you have yeah. limited resources, you become inventive. And if you're affluent and profligate, you, you have less need to be innovative. Do you, do you, do you think, B, when, when you work on projects that you find yourselves being more innovative because the resources are limited? Yeah, absolutely. And the skills are limited. Yes. And that, that yeah. would be true universally. That would be true anywhere in the world. The more constraints you have, the better your design usually will be because you have to think about it. You have to think about what, what you're doing. In our case, it will be physical resources perhaps, but it can be anything else. It can be a very bizarre site or not enough space or uh, any, any sort of really constraint or restriction, mm -hmm. water, flooding, that forces you to, to think harder and do more and the design will be better. I think everybody's experienced that in, in studios and also in professional practice. Yeah. Maybe we need to ask clients to give us constraints then. And well, <laughs> I, 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 well yeah. we try really yeah. hard to give you constraints. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we always have, we all have, it doesn't matter the project, the one constraint is your budget. That's, that's universal, yeah. right? Um, but beyond that, I think that's what we're trying to expand the criteria that you're thinking about. Uh, I think the environmental constraints are well established and hopefully baked into everybody's practice at this point. Um, but what else? And I think that that kind of social, it's that social responsibility piece. Or, and I don't even think responsibility is the right word. Actually, it's like, you know, it's so your, your, your humanity. Right. You know? so, I mean, so we can talk about you, like you, one, you, one you, little thing that, that we do at Article 25, and maybe it's silly. But when, when we meet with our communities and users early on in the project and say we're doing a school or a hospital or a clinic or something, we say, we usually ask, what else would you like? And it can be anything. Um, and the answer you could get back is a football pitch. So the, you add that to the project. Or maybe it's a well. Mm. And it's something that is in addition, that's like a bonus of the project and it adds to the cohesion of the community and it makes yet another difference in a way that wasn't anticipated and it's very inexpensive to do and all it really took was asking that question and getting them to argue what they really want and it is a hugely beneficial thing to do. Mm -hmm. It takes about half an hour. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's not that's a constraint, that's a of, bonus. Um, it's an example of an emotional impact. And you, what was exciting earlier on is you said you want to have emotional impact and that's not properly reviewed. So if, if, if in all our conventional projects of designing a home, designing a school, designing an office, the client said, and I want positive emotional impact, that, that, that might drive design differently. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But maybe you can propose it. Yeah. Tomorrow. Yeah. Talk about um, a kind of almost like a community consultant being part of these kinds of procurement <coughs> teams or an inclusive consultant because a lot of designers or architecture practices say they don't really feel like there's enough time within their existing program. Mm -hmm. So it's either like kind of that the RIBA extends the scheme of work to include that or there's actually a kind of new requirement. So communities is as important as engineering or whatever it might be. Yeah. Uh, um, I think we're going to have the last question, and this lady here was really keen. Um, and then we'll, we'll finish there. Yeah. Um, 
So we were just talking about impact. You mentioned that you were opening an office in London. Yeah, yeah. Um, what impact and benefit do you think that has on your project in um, Africa and the developing world? Having an office here? Yeah. Oh, it's a kind of business development question, I guess, in a way. But, um, uh, well, I, I mean, I, I'm looking, I think, we're looking to figure out how to bring our approach to work in the UK, in the EU, and also it's a heck of a lot easier to get to Monrovia from London that is Kigali right now. Um, so I think for parts of West Africa, it'll make a lot more sense, um, potentially, we'll see. But I'm, I'm, it's an office of one right now, so I mean, TBD, but yeah. Do you feel like there's some sort of resources that you'd be able to utilize here yes. that would hugely benefit your 100%. projects yeah. across? I, I mean, historically, I mean, I could gonna make some deductions of this question here, but so historically, our, a lot of our funding has been through U.S.-based organizations doing work in, in you know, in, in Africa and in Haiti and elsewhere. Um, it, you know, it, it would make sense to have an office here because we've largely not engaged groups and organizations that are doing that kind of work based in Europe or, or elsewhere. So, and we had this discussion last week. I mean, there's, there's like, to think about com competing in a space I find kind of funny because like, there's no, there's just so much work. There's like not really, it's not a competition. It's like we are just, how do you just, we need to figure out how to do it, right? And I think a lot of our, a lot of our say success has been, we've been able to figure out that's someone who needs a project. Okay, there's some money we can help figure you out. How, how do we get, how do we help you get it, right? And that's what we can bring as design service. We can help build a budget, program it, we can, Put a, we can put a pretty picture around that gets people excited. You know, the kind of thing that, that, that speculative work, frankly, but in a very different way for people who really, you know, the, the easy way to say it, we're designing, like Partners in Health, we, we were born out of that organization. Their mission is to deliver healthcare to the poorest of the poor. Our mission is to bring design to everybody. Um, design is a right, beauty is a right, and you should have access to it. It should not be something for the privileged. So, and we as architects, for the majority of, of certainly our work, that's not really who's, you know, employing us. So I think that's finding ways to, to finding every way through any project to make, to give the maximum impact of your ability and your design skills to people that are gonna use it every day. Thank you. You're welcome.